If you're an entrepreneur who wants to grow in business and you focus on solving problems, you'll make money. If you're an entrepreneur and you're in business and you're focused on making money, you're gonna have problems. I'm Tom Ward and over the last couple years I've had the chance to sit down with some of the biggest celebrities and influencers in the world. What I've always found most fascinating is the stories of the businesses that they've built behind the scenes. On this show, you'll get an inside look of what it takes to build a successful business from some of the biggest celebrities, business people, and up and coming entrepreneurs in the world. This is The Tom Ward Show. Welcome to The Tom Ward Show, where every week we talk to the most successful people in the world who teach us how to elevate our lives. Today, we have Alex Hormozzi. It's time to level up. A man needs no introduction. You know who he is. Alex, I do a ton of homework. I just put this on... Instagram stories. I mean, I got like 10 pages of notes. Like, I take these seriously. And when I'm going through all well, of I got this... time. This is my last one. Let's right, rock. Let's go. So, <laughs> I, I'm going through my notes and stuff, and one story really jumped out at me that kind of sums up, I think, what you're all about. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're a couple years out of college. You're working at a defense contracting place you hate, right? And you're you're doing the kind of the typical corporate thing, right? You graduate college, you work for a couple years, then get your GMAT and go get an MBA at a good school, right? So you're kind yep. of doing that. And I heard you say you read, you're, you're getting ready for the GMATs and you read this thing where it said like, you know, you Google, how do I do well in the GMATs? It says, well, the, you practice more, you practice more questions and your score is going to go up like this, right? So you go, yeah. okay, makes sense. And you take, correct me if I'm wrong, the next three months and you buy a shitload of, you know, study guides or whatever. And every right. night after work, you spend four hours a night for three months. And then you go in, you take the GMAT, and you ace it, right? Is that pretty much what yep. happened? That was so, the, yeah, it was four months, four okay. hours a day, 16, it was 16 phone books. I did one phone book per week of problems. If you've seen those things, like those big, fat, yeah. like really thick, really thin paper uh, problem things. So I did, I did one phone book per week. Most people do like one to prep. And I was like, well, if I do, you know, if one is good, 16 is better. Uh, and so <laughs> that's uh, but when I, when I saw that research thing, I was, that was it. Like that was done. I was like, all right, done. Like if, if that, if that's the input output equation to getting the best score is just do more problems. I was like, I can do that. But I think that's what separates you from, you know, a normal person out there, right? Because you're not the first to read that study. Hey, it makes sense to me. You're not the smartest guy. You practice more, you know, do more guides, you're going to get a better score, right? So this is no secret code, like it's out there, but people buy the books and they do it for a couple nights and then they don't do anything until it's the night before the GMAT, right? But you yeah. somehow, it seems like in many aspects of your life, which we'll talk about, you seem to have the ability to kind of make an educated decision. Like, here's my goal. I'm, I'm going to figure out kind of, I think the best way to get there. And then that's it. Like you just go... And whether it's social media, like not getting, I saw your, you know, congrats on the five years of the podcast and you had a good, you know, tweet or something about that too, where it's like, I didn't have success, but like, same thing with GMAT. It's like, I'm not getting instant gratification. I, yeah. I don't know what's going to do better, but I just keep going and keep going and put in the work and that's it. Do you think that's probably your greatest strength? I would say it's been a big part of why, why I say we, cause it hasn't just been me, but why we've been able to achieve a lot. Um, it's funny because I feel like the, the, the keys to the treasure chest are like in plain sight. It just has a timer on it. It just has a delay timer. Like, you, can, you know what I mean? Like, you can get the body you want. You can make the money you want. You can, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like you just can't have it now. But I would rather kind of like get rich slow for sure than get rich quick never. <laughs> um, and so it feels like the highest likelihood possibility. So it's like the slow way is really the only way. Um, and slow is relative, right? So depending on the goal, you know, slow might be a week, you know what I mean? Slow might be, it just depends on what the goal is. But, um, I think usually if you can extend the time horizon, uh, around whatever you're trying to accomplish, it makes attaining the thing actually more reasonable. Um, and that's really what a lot of my stuff has come down to is like, how do I make it unreasonable that I don't win? And then it's like, if I, if I can answer that question, then it's like, okay, well, cool. Then I, this is a high probability way of me getting there. And I would almost always rather take that path. Then, uh, I, like, it's one of the things with like unicorn companies, you know, um, I think the reason that we've gone into what we have now, which is a conglomerate structure, which is where we just continue to buy businesses that are growing and simple and cash flow, is like, I like to become the richest person in the world, likely, 
uh, you know, and then, then you've got, you got Warren Buffett, right? But for the most people, they do some sort of tech play uh, and they get to, you know, $10 billion or whatever it is, right? Um, and the likelihood of success there is actually pretty low if you just look at the graveyard of venture capital backed companies, right? Of course. Um, and so it's like, if I have, if that is the way, like it makes sense for the VCs to take 50 bets, but if N equals one and 100% of your eggs on one bet, that that's the path that I wouldn't necessarily take, at least now. Um, and if I just look at historically, I, I tend to go with the highest probability, uh, best outcome. Um, and so that's not always the absolute best path, but it's the relative best path, like risk adjusted. Um, and so I kind of take the best risk adjusted return paths for most things. Um, so there are trade-offs there, but that's what seemed to have worked best for me. You know, you said trade-offs too. You tweeted something else this week, I think, that it's everything has a price tag. It's like, are you willing to pay the price? Yeah. It sounds like it's exactly what you're talking about, right? It's like, okay, we know what to do. It's like, do you want to do it? Yeah, I think that's really what it, like, I mean, it is purposely overly simplified, but it does kind of come down to that. And I think, I think we're, I think what it, what a lot of people struggle with is that they complain about the price tag. And so it's like, I want the Nikes, but I don't want to pay $500, but I want the Nikes. And it's like, well, what are you going to do? You know what I mean? Stop. Like either stop, either stop wanting the Nikes, you know what I mean? Or pony up. Like that's, that's kind of it. Like I've, I've just, I haven't been, I haven't been much of a complainer. I would say that that's something that I'm, I'm okay at. Um, it's just kind of accepting reality. So a lot of this is really just like not being deluded. Like a lot of people, a lot of, cause a lot of that stems just from like internal entitlement of being like, um, it, Nike shouldn't be $500. They should be affordable for everyone. Right. It's like, but they are. And so now what, you know what I mean? Like now what are you going to do? Like either stop wanting the Nikes or do the thing, you know? And I, I don't know, sometimes it, maybe I'm making a false binary, but it feels a lot like that many times. Do you think like, um, I've heard you say too is, and it's not, it's funny, you said this, and it's not cool to say, you know, it's like negative motivation, right? Yeah. Fear and pain are great fucking motivators. And I've probably interviewed, I don't know, 200 plus like wildly successful people. And yeah. most of them were running from something, right? Like, yeah. I can't, you know, I can't go back to my high school, you know, friends, a failure after going to LA or, you yeah. know what I mean? I can't lose this Somebody gave me a grand and I got to no matter what, you know, make something of that. I can't go. You know what I mean? It just seems like there's something. Is that is that the pain you think that a lot of people are motivated by or just, you know, like I want those Nikes. Same thing. Like I want those fucking Nikes. Like when I was a kid, if I wanted yeah. a badass pair of shoes, my parents would go, OK, they're a hundred dollars. You're fucking insane. Like We'll give you 30. Yeah, right. And if you want those find a way to make 70 bucks. So like I go, I want yeah. those fucking shoes. I'll go mow lawns. I'll knock on doors. I'm going to get those fucking Nikes. Yeah. Like that, the pain of me not having them, not having cool yeah. shoes in school, like made me take the action. Like talk about yeah. that. Cause you, I mean, it sounds like that's what initially drove you was kind of a fear and a pain right at that first job yeah. out of school. Like, fuck, yeah. I don't want to do this. Yeah. You know, this is, this is something I, I think about a lot. This video is brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped, the best and below the waist men's grooming. Go to manscaped.com and enter code Tom Ward to get 20% off your order and free worldwide shipping. Before I got Manscaped, the only thing I had to use was my beard clippers. And more often than not, I would get nicked. And that is a very delicate area and you don't want to get nicked down there. So I just got the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0 and it's been amazing. They're geniuses over there. The first thing they did was they used a ceramic blade instead of a metal one. So it's going to greatly reduce nicks, which is a good thing. And they also used an LED light on it, which is really good. So you can see where you're going. Finally, it's waterproof. So you're not going to make a mess in the bathroom. And I got the performance package, which also includes the weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer. It's got deodorant to keep you fresh all summer long down there and an amazing pair of boxer briefs, which you'll love. So go to manscaped.com and enter code Tom Ward to get 20% off your order and free worldwide shipping. Unleash your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. And so I'm going to add a, a little layer of context on this, which might like make the audience be like, well, I don't know what to think now. But sometimes I think we look at success uh, in reverse and then we connect the dots, right? 
And what's interesting about that is that like most successful people uh, have a painful story, right? I would say that that's common, at least in people that I know, right? Yeah, I agree. But here's something else that's also true is that people who are not successful also have a painful story. Okay. And so the conclusion might just be that people have painful stories. And so then trying to extrapolate the fact that we had pain as the reason that we were successful, I don't know. Like when people ask me, it's probably more elegant on a podcast. And I think it's, it becomes relatable to an audience of like, oh, I went through shit too. And therefore I will, I can, I can do the same thing. Right. But if we were to isolate that, like the things that create the success is the doing, right? It's the action. And so why did I do it? I don't know. I mean, like, I, I know that when I was having tough times, I would think back to like how I just wouldn't fail uh, or rather I wouldn't give up, uh, better stated. And so I just knew that I was going to keep going. You know what I mean? And that's like, the, I, I just knew that I would not go back to my life before. Like I just wouldn't, that wasn't an acceptable path. And it's, it's, it's kind of dark when I, when I'll, I'll explain an analogy that I thought of a lot when I was going through tough times. But like, I think about slavery um, when I was going through like the very hardest times, right? And a lot of people in America think slavery and American slavery, but there's been slavery across the world for a very long time, everywhere slavery, right? And so I think about slaves in general, and they're, they do have one choice left, which is that they can choose to die, right? Like they, if they, they had the option, they could work or they could die, right? They could obey or die. Um, and for me, when I look at the level of output that slaves had, or at least that they have in my mind, um, not that I observe slavery, uh, they worked a lot, right? They worked all day long. They worked in tough, tough conditions. They worked long hours and yet they were able to. And so it's like, how can you have someone who's able to do that? And in masses, all of them were able to do that. And I was like, so then what is it? It's like, well, in that instance, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you have no choice, right? And so the choice was, die or work. And so if we take that as a, as a natural extreme, right? For me, going back home felt like death. And so a lot of the big decisions in my life have boiled down to this or die. And I have found that for me, I sometimes have to boil it down to that in order to get myself to do stuff. And so a lot of people see me as somebody who has like lots of work ethic, etc. But like, I don't know if I would necessarily describe myself that way. Like, a lot of times I have to just think like, this or die. <laughs> like the, the core, the core, uh, the core value of Jim Watch, which is our first big, bigger company. The first core value was grow or die. Um, and so I think thinking about time and thinking about death has been very, I've, I think I've been doing that since before I had money. Um, but it's just always been top of mind for me. Maybe that's just like my flavor of it. But in terms of entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, I am a big believer in using what you have. And so if you need a reason, then use shame, use anger, use fear, you know, use pain as the thing that quote motivates you. But for me, my like rock top moment was I had my consulting job, which I did not like, and I had enough money and I had enough clout to have a white collar thing. And I had a condo overlooking the city and I was 22 and um, I was just like, good. is this it? Yeah. And I was like, is this it? And I just remember thinking on my balcony and being like, God, like over and over again, night after night after night, I would just like hope I didn't wake up the next day. And this isn't like the point of getting to like mental health. I don't want to say bullshit, but like that's not the direction I'm going here. It's just more like I didn't want to wake up. And it was only when I was really confronted with the idea that I was like, that's probably not a good way to live. That it was the it was only then that I was able to like stand up to my dad. And I didn't even really stand up to my dad as much as like, retroactively, I want to make it sound like that. It wasn't that. I was a fucking pussy. I drove across the country before calling him <laughs> to tell him that I had left home. Seriously. You know what I mean? I was terrified of my dad. Um, really, it, was, it wasn't even terrified of him like physically. It was more just like I was terrified of his disappointment. You know what I mean? I just didn't want to disappoint him. And I knew that this would be the ultimate disappointment. Like I had done everything that he'd want me to do. And he was, it, was, it, was, it was messed up because... The moment when I was the absolute saddest in my life was the moment that he was the most proud of me. That's, that's a lot to, to wrap your head around. Yeah. And that was why it was so tough because I had this, re this positive reinforcer from the person who I wanted approval from the most. Yep. And I, deep down, felt hollow. I hated it. And I just like, 
and that's, you know, that's when I, I had to come up with these kind of catchy monikers for myself, which is like, I either have to die to him or I have to die to me. And so for me, like, that's what I kept repeating to myself, almost like a psychopath while I was like packing my stuff and making the decision to like get my stuff in my car and put my stuff up for, for sale and like all this stuff. Like, it was just like, I have to die to him in order for me to live. Um, and it was just like, I, once I got it to that, I was able to take steps. But until it got boiled down to that decision, I just, con- I just kept kicking the can. I kept procrastinating. I kept reading more personal development. I kept, because there, there wasn't YouTube then. Um, like I just kept reading books about self-help. What I realized after I read 10 self-help books that my life wasn't, wasn't different. And it was because I hadn't changed my behavior, right? And so one of the things that I've, like, that's helped me now 10 years later, 15 years later, whatever it is, is that just learning the definition of, of learning itself, right? Which is that when you learn something, it means that when you're exposed to the same condition, you have a different behavior. So if I show you a red card and then I slap you, right? If I show you a red card again and then you duck, you have learned, right? I show you condition, you change your behavior, right? And so my conditions had not changed and neither had my behavior. So I kept getting, every morning I'd have the same red card put in front of me and I would just get slapped by life. Red card, slap, and I just didn't change. And so one of the interesting things is that you can also measure intelligence by rate of learning, right? So speed of learning. So somebody who learns slow is dumb. Somebody who learns fast is smart. Mm -hmm. And so if intelligence is a speed, it's a rate of learning, right? It means how quickly do you change your behavior? And so if you're somebody who reads lots of stuff for years and years and years and you don't change your behavior, you are dumb, right? Or you're dumber than someone who moves faster than you. And so like a lot of people feel like they're big smarty pants because they spend all this time reading stuff, but they don't change what they do. And so it's like, if you don't change your behaviors, your environment won't change. And so that was for me kind of some of the bigger findings early on of what I needed to do was I needed to move. And if you're in a tough spot, the easiest way to change your behavior is to change your environment. And I needed to get as far away from Baltimore, Maryland as I possibly could. Now, two things, right? One, I think an important part of that story is you didn't just decide, hey, I'm doing this and leave the next day, right? There was, you said six months between, okay, I'm yeah. leaving and you loading up the car, right? So yeah. th- there was some time there. This just didn't happen one night. I don't want the viewer or listener to just think like, no. oh shit, I, I got to take drastic action today and leave, go somewhere yeah. tomorrow. Like it took some yeah. time, you know? But the other thing too is, I was, I was you. I'm from the East Coast. I, I'm from South Jersey. And after college, I was selling cars, right? We'll talk sales yeah. later, right? Yeah. But in Philly at this Mercedes place. Anyway, I used to take the train to work. It used to drive me over there. And I would go over the Delaware Bridge every day on the train. And I would just hope the train plunged into the fucking yeah. Delaware River, right? I didn't like, I wasn't, I would never, I wouldn't kill myself. But like, if it went yeah. in, I wouldn't be sad, like going down. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and what advice do you have for the young me or the person watching this who's like, okay, I'm exactly where Alex was. Tom, I can relate. I'm with you. I'm in my 20s or maybe even older and I'm stuck. I know I don't want to continue going this way, but I also don't have the, I, the inspiration to start a gym. Like, I don't know what my thing is. I know I want to be an yeah. entrepreneur. I want to have my own thing. I don't even know what it is. Like, what do you have to say to them? Do you have any suggestions? <sighs> Unless something changes, it won't get better. And so I think that, that like, it's just taking the line and taking it all the way to the, its natural end and saying like, okay, if you did this for the rest of your life, then what, right? Now, either you just feel the same way you feel for the rest of your life, or you just get become numb to it, and you would probably just shift priorities to somewhere else in your life, and you'd give up on whatever that dream is. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's fine. A lot of people do that, right? Some people call that settling. Um, whatever. I mean, a lot of people have big goals, and then when they don't achieve those big goals because they take no action towards them, they just change their goals, right? And um, there's definitely a lot of gurus on the internet. It's like, never change your goals, always change how you get there. But like, you might have kids and realize this is more, that's more important to you. You know what I mean? So I think there are, again, there are trade-offs, right? Um, but for me, my yearn for independence uh, was, was suffocating. I, I really, really, really was very miserable. And the idea of continuing to live the existence that I was didn't feel like an option that I wanted. 
And so it was kind of confronting that reality for me. And a lot of times we just hide it. You know what I mean? Like you start thinking about it, you start getting really sad, and then you're like, all right, let's think about something else, right? Let's put on the game <laughs> or so, something. Let's have a drink. Yeah, right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So we basically numb ourselves through distraction, right? Yep. And um, I think sometimes it's like you just got to look at it. Just look at the muck and be like, fuck. It's hard. Like this isn't going to change. Right. Yeah, totally. But I look. think. Yeah, you don't want to look, but I think it's that that pain sometimes can can motivate some of the biggest changes in your life. And as a total side note here, the um, I have noticed when I look back on my life that micro pain has created macro macro growth. And so a lot of the like you get fired, right? Micro pain, but then you switch career paths and you like your new job better. Macro growth. Right. And so a lot of times you have to extend the time horizon around whatever the incident is in order to like reap the benefit from it. And so a lot of times it's like if you hate something, it's like, just wait, you know, and just like and sometimes the context can change. Um, but if you are on that Jersey Bridge right now or your figurative Jersey Bridge and you're in the audience right now, um, I. I think there's just a big myth around passion. And this is I mean, I was not passionate about really any of the, like, I wanted to get into fitness. So I started a gym because I liked fitness and then rapidly never talked about fitness ever and was only talking about memberships and recurring revenue and like all these other things that I had no idea. Like I didn't, like I had a, I had a mentor way back when who said, never do something you love. He said, because then it becomes work. And so totally different advice, right? Um, and just, just to give the audience like a, a contra from everything else that's on social media today. Um, but I think that you only really love something if you're good at it and you only get good at stuff by doing a lot of it. And if you start doing something that you haven't done before, you'll probably suck. And so you have to suck in order to be good. And so how can you say that you have to be passionate about something? It's basically saying I have to have the end result before I do the first step. You know, you're so right. I interviewed Gary V and he had a great line. He was talking about how he started his career working his dad's liquor store and he starts wine tv or whatever on youtube he goes dude i made videos for seven years and no one gave a fuck he goes yeah but i love the process i just yeah. loved talking to the camera setting up you know kind of preparing a script talking about wine getting feedback once in a while so he goes that's what kept yeah. me going you know is i just like doing it and then after doing it for seven years i actually finally got good at it and you were saying the same thing this week when you were celebrating your five year podcast anniversary, right? Like, did you knock it out of the park your first episode? No, it was six years. So it was oh, four sorry. years. No, you're good. No, it's, yeah. I, I remember every one of them, right? Uh, <laughs> no, so the, yeah, first four years, and just for the audience, my average monthly listens was 2,000 to 3,000 uh, for the first four years. Um, and then, you know, now magically overnight, you know, we get millions of downloads and whatnot, but like, it just, it, it, it wasn't like that, but I'll say two things. So one is volume, right? It's just the volume of action. Now here's the catch is that like, I've seen some guys who actually have made content for like five years and they're still the same size. The thing is, is I think there's a second element to that, which is uh, feedback is that you need to, like, you can't do the exact same thing every day for five years and expect that it will be different. The point of the work is for you to get better, not because you need, like, I didn't need four years of podcasting in order for the podcast to then take off. I needed four years to get good enough for it to take off. That was, like, that's the difference. You know what I mean? And I think that little piece is kind of like what's missing. And so then it's like, okay, well, then how do I get feedback? And so... In my opinion, you go to people who are further ahead of you um, and you ask them for feedback and you listen to the audience. Like, so you have, I mean, the market's always going to be the biggest, but if you don't have like the skill set to even analyze what the audience is saying, then asking other people just for big, obvious things that you can do to get better, right? And then you implement those changes and you see how they go. And um, from, a, from a big picture perspective, the reason that, you know, Gary was able to do seven years and I was able to do, you know, the four years of my podcast that sucked um, is that you find shorter games to play in the meantime. And so like patience is a terrible directive. Like if you tell someone be patient, it means nothing. Like what is it like if I'm like be patient, what do I do with that? Yeah, nothing. nothing. <laughs> There's nothing you can do with that, right? And so telling someone to be patient is a terrible directive. What you should do is instead tell them what to do in the meantime. 
And so like right now, you and I are being patient for every other thing in our entire life with the exception of this podcast. Like everything, all the goals that you have, like they're going on. Like time is elapsing, right? And so like I'm being patient for some of the goals that I have in this exact moment. I might be trying to lose five We all appreciate that. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, and so it's finding the mini games. It's finding the mini games that you can win on. It's like, if you ever run a marathon, uh, it's like you, you don't, you don't. Yeah, you don't run 26 miles. Yeah, you don't run 26 miles. You you make it to the tree, right? And then when you're at the tree, you make it to the sign. And when you're at the sign, you make it to the rock. And when you're at the rock, you make it to the goose station, right? Yep. And so you just rope a hundred or a thousand mini wins together. And so I remember when we had our my my hundredth episode, right? Which also didn't fucking matter, right? <laughs> but it was a win for me. And that was enough to keep me going. And so I think it's just like, can you chunk, you know, can you eat the elephant one bite at a time? And I think measuring, and this is a really big one, is that if there's one habit that I can encourage anyone to do who's going on a big goal or a path that they think is going to take a long time, is that you want to measure as many things as you can. And you want to do that because the more ways you measure, the more ways you can win. And so like, let's say you measure 10 different metrics, right? It's like, Average person who starts listening to my podcast, average listen time, uh, average clicks to my to my link, uh, total downloads per month, total downloads per day, right? Like you have all these different me- total minutes, right? These are all different metrics. And so you might not win on nine out of the 10, but you might get one. And you're like, you know what? I fucking won. I got one this month, right? And so the more red, but you got measure- one green. Exactly. The more ways yep. you measure, the more we can win. And that's the, like, if there's a, if there's a tweetable summary, it's the more ways you can measure, the more ways you can win. And that is what allows you to win in the meantime is to figure out what to do to get short feedback cycles so that you can get better. Because like, you don't need to take time to hit the big goal. You need to take time to get good enough to hit the big goal. Like that's the tweak. Like big goals take time because it takes us time to get good enough. You know, that's great advice. And the other thing, too, I like about that is kind of showing time. But then it's easy to look at you, especially like you came on my radar. I think like most people, TikTok, right? Who's this fucking guy, Alex Ramosi? Why is everybody following? Got the same neon text and emojis flying around. Who is this guy that everybody's copying, right? So it's easy to go, Alex has been successful forever, right? Because I see him on TikTok. I see him on, you know, we have podcasts. He's everywhere. But the other thing I like about your entrepreneurial journey too is, so you, you go out to LA, you do the gyms, you sell the gyms, you get, you get more, you get six gyms, you sell them. I don't, you made some money. Now yeah. you go into your next venture. This is what, this is what's the fun, the fun part, right? What's the next venture? Yeah. And then I start, uh, I, well, I had like four next ventures at the same time because I had entrepreneurial ADD and I didn't know that, what focus was. Uh, so I, I'll tell you a little bit more color on it. So I had a dental agency. I had a chiropractor agency. Yeah, I had. Uh, and then I had I had my launch business and I still owned my gyms at that time. And then I, you know, I got out of the gyms and then I had those three. And so when I got out of the gyms, I decided to get rid of the, the two agencies um, and go all in. And so I put all the cash I had from the sale into this launch and go model. So I had a uh, so I'd go to a gym, I'd fill it up, I'd keep the cash from the launch, and then they would keep the customers. That was kind of the deal. And one of the, uh, after I did like three launches, and they did really well. And of course, like all entrepreneurs, something works well. I said, we should change this, right? And so, so on my fourth launch, one of the guys that I did in the first three was like, hey, man, I'm a really good operator. I'll just come behind you, and we can just do these together. Like, instead of filling up other people's gyms, like, you sign the lease, build it out. Uh, and fill it up and then I'll come behind you and set the team up and we can just open a gym every month. And I was like, sounds great. And he's like, of course, naturally, like I don't have the best credit. I had a divorce, blah, blah, blah. Um, just details you wouldn't care about. And I was like, of course. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I, he's like, you'll just have to personally guarantee everything and be the one on the lease and, and also front the money for the build up. But, but we'll, we'll split it after you, you do all the work. And I was like, this sounds like a great deal. Like this guy sounds amazing. Right. Um, and so, I mean, the audience already knows where this is going. Yeah. Uh, and so I crushed the launch. We did 300 and something uh, people signed up, which is really big for like a small, like a micro gym. Uh, probably 100 something thousand in sales uh, in the first month. And, uh, and then all of a sudden I checked the bank out one day and uh, it's just, it's empty. And I was like, what? Like, huh? And uh, so I called my partner and I was, I just see a deposit for or a withdrawal for everything. And I was like, well, what's this? And uh, he was like, oh, that's my half. And I was like, what? He was like, he's like, I know you've been skimming. And I was like, 
what? <laughs> like, I fronted all the money to this thing. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? And like, <laughs> from what? And so, anyways, I was really distraught because I've never been I've never been accused of stealing. So I um, I talked to a mentor of mine. And he was like, it might be a misunderstanding. He might have been screwed in the past. Like, just take all the financials and go line by line with him. And I was like, cool. So I took the financials, printed it all out, went line by line. So I, I went to him with like this big stack. And I remember putting it on the desk, and he pushed it off the desk. He's like, I don't need to see that shit. And I was like, oh. I got robbed. He doesn't care at all. And that's when, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, when, uh, money beats experience, experience gets the money and money gets the experience. Um, I was, a, I was a living, breathing example of that. And so, uh, I lost everything. And so that was the first time that I lost everything. <laughs> um, Wait, hold so, on. Just pause right yeah. there. So, and thank yeah. you for telling the story that I'm sure you've told a million times before. Right? Yeah, so, thank you for that. Right? I won't make you do that again. So, see, so, so you're broke, right? You get yeah. robbed. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready? Without getting the processor and getting yeah. money and all this other stuff, yeah. you're down to like your last grand, right? That was the and, second time I lost it. All. Oh, that Don't was the second you're... time. What happened yeah, after this? The, the what happened time. after this time? <laughs> oh shit! Okay, I'm jumping ahead. What happens after <laughs> this? What's the next? So. Move? Layla, my then girlfriend, was like, hey, maybe we should go back to the original thing that actually made money. And I was like, you might be onto something. Um, and so she actually went, so, I, so he took all the money out of that gym. And I still had all these customers I had to deliver on. Like I had no cash to like pay payroll and pay rent. Like it was all gone. But I couldn't sell more because I didn't want to sell more people. So I didn't want to keep the gym open because I wanted to like go back to the other model. I was like, I've already, I've already exited my gyms. Like I'm done with this phase. I'm doing this other thing. And so she flew to Hawaii and did this really, I was like, you need to crush this launch. Like we need all the money here. And Layla set the record for most sales ever. She did 228 sales, um, in, in, in 28 days, which was great. I, we did 300 something, but it was over like two months. Um, and it was both of us. So she did 228 as a, as a, as a solo chick, going to Hawaii, just slaying. And um, for context for everybody, like this is the heydays of Facebook ads. I spent a thousand dollars in Facebook advertising. We did 228 sales at 600 bucks a pop. Wow. Crazy. It was insane. And so anyways, I, we took all the cash and all of that cash pretty much just went right back into that business that I had just basically gotten robbed from um, to, to fund all of the just cash flow from the business, right? Um, and so that pretty much still zeroed me out. And so uh, I, I wound down that gym and we started uh, going, going back to the launch model. And so Layla, being the ever believer that she was, got all of her friends from high school, uh, six of them, to quit their MLM, you know, selling shake mix jobs yeah. to join us doing gym launch. And this was back when, it, again, it was just the launch, go, flying out and launching gyms, turnkey. And so uh, I'm now at Layla's family's house. And, uh, right after she did that launch, we had one more launch that I needed. So like her launch got us to cover the negatives. Right. So still I still broke. have no, I'm yeah, still yeah, broke. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Still broke, Right. And so then we have another launch that's supposed to go right before we're going to do six launches in one month, which is like, of course, cause that's the logical thing to do is go from one to six, whatever. More so better. yeah. Right. So there's this launch in San Diego that we're supposed to do the next month. Uh, this is like November, December. And, uh, I, I needed to crush this launch too. And by chance of fucking gods, uh, a guy reaches out to me who had seen me sp like at this mini gym event and was like, Hey man, do you need a sales guy? And, uh, I was like, I actually do need a sales guy. I was like, but, uh, it's, it's going to be somewhere across the country. I was like, I'm, it's this gym in San Diego. And he's like, no way. I live 10 minutes down the street from there. And like, this was like a random DM from like, it could have been from anywhere. And he's like, I've got, I've got a kid on the way and I've got a, a six month old, like I need this. And I was like, shit, he really needs to sell, but I could use the time to get all this other stuff together before the six launch that, you know, later that month. And so I was like, all right, man, let's do it. And so he crushes his launch, does another hundred grand, uh, in sales in that period of time. But like, I'm seeing all the contracts come through, I'm running and I'm processing them. And this is now getting into December. Right. And I was like, I always get my deposits on Tuesdays. Like Tuesday was my big deposit because I would get uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday would deposit on Tuesday. So it was like always the biggest deposit of the week. And uh, it didn't come. And I was like, this is fucking weird. And so then I, you know, a week passes and, and then the next Tuesday, again, nothing. And I was like, what the hell is, what's, what's up? So I call, I call the processor 
And they're like, oh, this is a standard annual review that we do on accounts. I was like, I've been with you guys five years. Like, I've never had this happen. And they're like, oh, it's fine. I was like, okay. They waved me off, and I was like, okay. So a couple more days pass, nothing. The third Tuesday in a row comes, and I was, I was like, dude, I, I need money. Like, yeah. where's, where's my money? And um, I called. They gave me the runaround. I talked to a manager. He's like, just, you know, a couple more days, blah, blah, blah. It will be all resolved. And so finally, it's Christmas Eve now, December 24th. I'm at Layla's family's house. The guy that she left her comfortable job that she'd built out her big roster of clients that she met on the internet, who now has nothing, who's sleeping in their spare bedroom, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, right? I'm just only using quotes because it's the only kind of entrepreneur I was, right? I'm, I'm in their, their, their spare bedroom where their, ki- their grandkids are with all these little toys around me and a little baby desk and, you know, like the little kid chairs. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sitting with a little fucking, you know, I mean, just like every, I'm just like, I've got these fucking, these little stuffed animals staring at me like a loser. And I was like, God, like I suck. And so I'm on the phone with this processing company. And I was like, listen, I will not get off this phone until you send me the money. I was like, I just, I'm not, I was like, I have nothing to do, but be here. And so, uh, an hour or two later, um, finally they were like, sorry, do per the policy, blah, 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 blah. You have a regular activity. And w- what it was, was I was processing contracts through my gym processor in California, but it was like a national business. Wow. And so yeah. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how that worked. I just knew that, yeah, you process money through here, but it was approved for a brick and mortar transaction. And we had, you know, transactions all over the place. Right. And so, yeah, it was a fucking nightmare. And so anyways, I get shut down. Um, and they say, we're going to hold the hundred grand. And I was like, dude, I've got a guy who, who, who's, who needs a kid. Yeah. yeah I've, I was like, it's Christmas Eve. I was like, have a heart. <sighs> I have never been meaner and like, not like cursing out. Cause that's not how I get mean. Like just assassinated someone's character. <laughs> like I've never been so cutting and cold as I was to the, whoever the, the person was on the other side of the line. Like I, I true to this day, I, like Layla was like, I'd never want to see you talk to anybody like that. <laughs> and uh, it didn't matter. And so uh, I owed the guy $22,000 in commissions on the hundred grand. And I had $23,000 left. Wait, this is the guy with the kid? The yeah. San Diego guy? Yeah. And so I sent him the twenty two grand. Um wow. which was the last of the money that I had. And I had a thousand dollars left. And it was because I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to put myself in a position to like not follow through. You know what I mean? Like I'm just this is not me. You know what I mean? Well, and first so I just of all, stop there. Like, blah, blah, blah. Stop right there. Me, I go, hey, it's Christmas Eve, processing, things are fucked up. Here's fifteen or here's ten. Yeah. In a couple of weeks, that'll get you through Christmas and the holidays. And I'm sorry about it, yeah. but a couple of weeks, we'll straighten it out. Not you. Why? Why wouldn't you hold on to more than a grand? I mean, why not hold on to something? I mean, it could have been a combination of like not having enough of a problem solving mentality yet and just kind of still being a little bit of a victim of circumstance. Like I have to pay him. You know what I mean? Um, like you, I could make the argument from that perspective. Um, but I think it was like when I had the, when I had the, the gym, like the, the theft thing, I was so sensitive to like doing right by everyone. Sure. Um, and the coach that I had at that time, it was just like a mindset, coach, basically just like a performance, whatever you want to call it. Um, I talked to the guy every day during that period of time because it was really hard for me. And he basically said, the only way you get out of this, when I, when I shut down the gym that I just started. So think about like, it's easy to talk about. But like, I just sold 370 something members into a gym that they all saw me and I was like, this place is going to be amazing. It's going to be all this stuff. And then six to eight weeks later, shutting the gym down. Like, that just looks horrible. Like, it just, I mean, I had, a, I had a news reporter who was like, this guy's, I, to this day, they, they, called, they called Layla and I the Bonnie and Clyde of the fitness industry, which I love the nickname <laughs> as a side note. You should um, go back to that. But- yeah, it's like, I just love that nickname. <laughs> but like they tried to do this whole, like and I was and, and I was like I don't like anyways. And so he said the only way you get out of this, like truly get out of this is you do right by everyone. He's like and you'll walk out unscathed. And so he gave me that advice and I wrote every single person a refund. Um and that's what we took the 100 grand from Layla's thing to like write everyone refunds um and just just do right by everyone. And so in this instance the, uh, you know, the, the, the 22 that I owed him, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to stop now. I was like, I just went through all that. I'm not going to stop now. And so, um, yeah, I remember cause I screenshotted all my bank accounts after I paid him. Cause I was like, I will fucking remember this. And the thing was, is like for everyone who's in the audit, like 
maybe you have a thousand dollars or whatever it is, but like I, you know, I had six gyms before this. I was used to having working capital and you know what I mean? Like I had stuff and I was like, wow, this is what I, even when I had my job, I'd never been that low. You know what I mean? Like I saved my money. I had 50 grand that I saved up over the two years. And that's how I started my gym and then like continue to grow my savings and all that stuff. Like I had never had nothing. And so I was like, wow, this is, this is tough. Um, and so that was the next day. Uh, we started uh, advertising for all six gyms. Um, and that was 3,300 a day in advertising, uh, between gyms, hotel, airfare, rent a car, um, per diems for the guys for food sure. and then commissions. Right. And so it's 3,300 a day and I had a thousand dollars in total. And, uh, I still had my credit card from when I had my six gyms. So they hadn't shut off my, my card or changed my limit or whatever from when I had my six gyms. And so thankfully Amex did not you know, re audit my ability to repay, you know, repay credit cards. And, um, I put it all in the card and that's when I, I told Layla, like right before, like we're at her parents' house and I'm, you know, her dad's like, he seems kind of stressed. <laughs> Mind you, they've got the hundred grand holding. Right. And they said, we're going to give it to you in six months. So that's not useful for me. Yeah. Um, I just paid 22. I've got a thousand bucks left. All the ads start on the 26th, which is actually like, that's like the best time for fitness sales is the day after Christmas. Through, like people think yeah, it's New course. Year's is when the, when the sales start. There's this whole dead week where everyone's at home, has nothing to do, and they feel fat as shit. That's when they all show up to their appointments. They like everyone buys for the new year. It, it's that's the best week for sales for gyms. And so I was like, I can't miss this. I can't miss this week. Like we have to market. You know what I mean? And so, um, and so that's when I sat her down and I was like, listen, like you've been with me for, you know, whatever it was like, I think it was, we start, we, we got together April of, of, uh, of, of 16. And this is now December of 16. So it's been like eight months. <laughs> and she's like, now gone, like she's seen me like lose everything twice. You know what I mean? Like sell all my, all of this in eight months, right? I got a DUI, uh, like she picked me up from jail. Like, I mean like winner, right? Just like for sure. true winner. And, uh, it's, I was like, listen, it's been kind of tough for you. So like I, and I, you know, this was all obviously very heartfelt as I'm joking about it, but I, I was like, I would understand if you didn't want to be with me. I was like, Hell we're, yeah. we're cool. We're cool. Like I don't, I won't hold, hold resentment. I was like, but I feel like a sinking ship right now. Um, and so like, and I think part of me just like, you know, I was just ashamed of me. You know what I mean? At that point, I just felt like a loser. You know what I mean? Like nothing that I had done had worked. I just spent five years, like, like for the audience, like I just, I just, I had a chain of gyms. Like I had been successful on paper now. And I, I had felt like a failure in the beginning of that leaving home and, and sucking for a while in the beginning there. And then I started, you know, then the gym started working, working, and then losing it all. It felt like I had just given up five years of my life and I had literally nothing to show for it. Nothing. You know what I mean? And so like, that was really tough for me. And so um, that's when she said, uh, you know, I would sleep with you under a bridge if it came to that. And um, I mean, that's when I was like, I mean, she's fucking in, you know, and that was uh, that was a that was a big moment for us. And then um, and then we spent the thirty three hundred a day in debt <laughs> uh, for a month. And uh, I still and if you really want to hear the crazy part of this, and I guess we're going there. So Why not? Um, I I didn't have a processor still. So like, it's just this wrinkle in the story that people forget. Like I didn't have a processor because on the 24th, they told me I didn't have one. I started spending 3,300 a day on the 26th. And so all the sales guys are closing contracts and sending me go. and scanning me the contracts, the credit cards. Yeah. I couldn't process, it. but I still did it because I was either a retard, which is possible. <laughs> right. Um, and the thing is, is once you get shut down by a processor, it's like going bankrupt. I wasn't bankrupt, but like, it, it's like in the processing world, it's like, one of the questions they ask you is like, have you been in jail or hit a woman? And then it's like, have you been shut down by a processor before? And so I had to answer yes. And so then everyone rejected me. So then I had to go to like hit up my network and be like, hey, who here has got like high risk shit? And so a guy was like, hey, I process for like internet, you know, scams and uh, porn and gambling. And he's like, I'm your guy. And I was like, Jesus Christ, here we go. And he's like, yeah, my processor are happy to take you on. He's like, we'll take 10% of top line. I was like, what? <laughs> Yeah, as yeah, as a rolling reserve, he's like, and then our fees are eight percent, and I was like, holy, holy shit! So eighteen percent of top line was going to the processor, right? Wow. And so, and he's like, and I can only get you fifty grand of processing, <laughs> wow. and I was like, Christ! And uh, and so I get the processor turned on the last day of January, 
And I was like, dude, I still need more. And he's like, well, the good news is it's per month. He's like, so you can run another 50 on the first day of February. I was like, okay. So I run 50 the last day of January, 50 the first day of February. That covers, covers my, gives me 100. That covers the 3,300 a day from the month before. And for everyone tracking at home, I'm still broke. <laughs> and so, and then the next month, uh, I got another process. And then I think they du- the first guy doubled to 100. And then I got another one at uh, another 100 uh, in terms of processing power. And uh, I think I did like 180 the next month. And so I profited like 30 grand. And I was like, holy shit, I might have made it out of it. Like, I might be there. Um, but I was wrong. And so uh, the next month, <laughs> Layla taps me on the shoulder and shows me, uh, she turns her laptop to me and I see all of our processing. And it just is a wave of refunds, just negative, negative, negative. And I was like, I just lost a processor. How am I going to deal with this? Like, what's yeah. going on? And, um, and it turns out and her phone's blowing up because she had basically been the admin at one of the gyms um, when we did a launch. And the customers who she had sold were like, hey, the gym owner is just telling us to refund and sign up through him. And I was like, fuck. And so, right, because we'd sold all these customers, we'd left, and then there, and the guy, and the thing is, is like, the average gym owner takes home $36,000 a year in take home, average, wow. which means, and some of these guys are below average, right? Um, and so they see some kids from the internet fly out to their gym, rip a hundred grand out in like three weeks and then dip. And they were like, fuck, fuck these guys. guys. <laughs> right? And so, and so they, uh, and so they just told everyone, Hey, cancel through them. I'll deliver the whole thing that you paid for, for half the price. Just sign up to me. Mm-hmm. But I had already paid for the airfare, the rental cars, the commissions, like ad spend, all that stuff for that launch. Right. So I didn't just lose all the money. I now was negative because I had cost, Right. And so now I have 150, so two gyms did this. One actually just, uh, one did that. The other one just said, I can't deal with this. Just everyone leave. Um, because when everybody, it's funny, everybody wants way more customers until you triple someone's business in a month. And so I didn't know enough about business yet to understand that I had to meet customers where they were, right? And so like if a gym goes from 70 clients to 270 clients in three weeks, they don't have the infrastructure. They have no. They don't have the trainers. They don't have no sessions. They don't have the, the square footage, whatever it is. And and it was funny because when we'd take sales calls for for telling people we're going to fill the gym up, I was like, "How much square footage do you have? How many sessions per day can you do?" And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, okay, like sure, like you're going to sign up 200 people, and then we'd sign up 250 people, and they'd lose their minds." Uh, and like, they would come in and start disrupting sales appointments, like stop signing people up. Like it was nuts. Right. But like, I was like, I got costs. I got to keep selling. And so, um, it was misaligned incentives. Right. And so, uh, anywho, uh, two guys, two guys refund. I have $150,000 that in profit that I now have to make in 30 days. And I was like, how the fuck am I? Like, I haven't made that ever in any month in my whole life. You know what I mean? In profit. Right. And so, like, I don't sleep for a few days, basically. Um, and I'm just like, just like, you know, you're, you're staring, you're like, brain, think of something. Like, think of something. You know what I mean? And um, I thought of all sorts of, I was like, maybe I could call the old gyms and sell all, those supp- the, the, all the clients we sold supplements. So I had a list of those clients. I was like, maybe I could make an app or something. Like, I had no idea. And so I was like, maybe I could pre-sell future launches. You know what I mean? Like, it's a, hey, I made 100 grand, like, pay me 50 and I'll give you all of the money when we do. You know, I was just like, anything I could think of. And so... I had eight launches that were supposed to happen the next month. And so uh, I was like, Layla, screw these launches. Like, let's figure something else out. And so she had, and this was during the morning, she was checking her clients. Uh, and I was, and, and she had online clients. She was t- taking her in-person training clients and made them online. Oh, nice. And uh, I like snap at her. I was like, hey, how much money do you make from that? And she was like, I don't know, like four grand a month. And then she like defensively, because I was so angry about it. She was like, she was like, hey, this is putting food on the table. And I was like, I was like, no, no, I know, I know. But like, how much time does it take you? And she's like, I don't know, a couple hours a week. And I was like, and it's, there's nothing else. And she's like, no. I was like, so it's all profit. He was like, yeah. And I was like, why don't we just start selling your program, right? And we'll call it Queen Transformation because she lost 100 pounds, done fitness competitions, all that stuff. And I was like, let's use your story. Fuck me. I'll be in the back. I'll just run the sales team. And I'll market you. And we can just sell your thing and cut the middleman out. And she was like, all right, let's give it a shot. And so I spent 48 hours writing the best sales letter of my entire life. Um, I started running ads to the sales letter. It starts working. She starts taking phone calls all day. She starts doing two or three deals a day, doing a thousand bucks a day, selling online programs, selling 16 week transformations for 500 bucks a pop. 
right? Online. And I was like, okay, thousand bucks a day, one person. We've got eight sales guys. If we add them in, we could do eight thousand a day, eight thousand a day after costs and commissions, I could be at one fifty. I was like, this could work. Wow. And so I was like, okay, you keep doing that and I'm gonna call the gyms up that we're supposed to launch the next month and tell them that we're not gonna do it so we can we can do this thing. And so I'll call the first gym up and he's like, I tell him, you know, tell him that we're move changing directions and he's like dude, I just refinanced my house and I maxed out my credit cards. Like I need, I need these clients. And I was like, dude, I'm, I'm in just as tough a spot as you right now. <laughs> and so like my empathy levels were not high. Um, but he was like, uh, yeah, I wish I could have been, I was just like, I was like, dude, I, I don't have the emotional bandwidth for this. And, uh, but he said, but he was, but he was like, dude, you launched a buddy of mine's gyms. Like, I know you can fill it. Like I seen what you can do. And this was like, everything went fine with that one, Right. And, um, and he kept saying, like, dude, I know you can do this. Help me. And uh, I was like, all right, man. And after, like, enough of that, I was like, all right, man, I'll show you what to do. I was like, but I'm not flying out there to save your ass if you can't close. And he was like, no, I can close, man. I just need leads. I was like, all right, I'll show you how to do it. He's like, well, how much? And I didn't want to do it because I wanted to do this other thing because that felt like it was going to work. So I just picked the highest number I could think of to get him off the phone. He said he was broke already. So I was like, I was like, six grand. And he was like, 6K? I was like, yeah. He was like, done. And I remember being, I, like, I still get goosebumps when I tell the story. I just remember looking at the phone and just like not even be able to know what words to say. And then like my subconscious kicked in because as soon as he said that, I was like, what car would you like to use to start with a four? You know, like, and, I, and I write down the guy's credit card and, uh, and I was like, oh, and I was like, yep. And he's like, hey, when do I get the, the stuff? And it's a Friday. And I was like, uh, Monday morning. And he was like, what okay, did he pay for? what was the six grand for? I yeah. Clear on so that. The six grand was for the entire launch system. So basically I had already documented everything. So like all the sales training for my guys, all my shit ads, was internal. All yeah. All my stuff was internal though. Oh, so okay. I had the training on like what to do with the customers, how to do nutrition orientations, how to do the sales. The only thing I had to create was just like, these are the ads. This is the landing page. That was it. Everything else was already made. It was internal training for my team. Right. Yeah. And so all I did was I took my internal training and gave them logins to my internal training and then added in the marketing part on the front end. And that's what I spent the weekend making. And Monday morning, he got access to it. But I still had seven more calls that Friday because I, I had eight guys. So I, yeah. I called the first one. He said, six, hey, sure. Called the second one. Same conversation. And now I know I got to make it. So I was like, well, shit. He's like, how much? I was like, eight grand. And he was like, done. I was like, holy shit. So I called the next guy, same conversation. He's like, how much? I was like, 10 grand. And he was like, okay. By the end of the day, I had $60,000 in sales, cash collected in one day. All profit. And profit, right? Selling air, yeah. right? It was just licensed materials, right? Because I let them use my face, my, like, all, like, I just, I didn't even say, I didn't even say go record ads. I was like, these are the ads I run. Like, mm -hmm. run these ads and change, just put your fucking name here. Like, it was, it was just what I would do when I would, when we'd launch gyms in new markets. And so, anyways. Uh, that was my day. Layla is selling weight loss packages the same day. We, we come in like, you know, we, we meet back up after our day of phone sales and she's like, I got another one. She's like, yeah, she takes her, takes her headphones off. And she's like, I just got another one. I was like, I was like, babe. And she was like, what? I was like, I think we're still in the gym business. And she was like, what? And she was like, I was like, I, th I think we're just doing it wrong. And she's like, what do you mean? And I was like, so I just sold all the stuff that we've been doing to the gyms. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, but they just wanted to like do it themselves and like, just have us help. But like, we don't have to fly there. And she's like, is that what we're doing now? I was like, I just, I just made 60 grand. And she's like, so we're not doing the weight loss thing that you just sold me so hard on. And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and so, and she's like, well, is this what we're going to do? Like, how are you going to get other gyms to, to buy it and all that stuff? I was like, well, we've launched 30. I was like, I'll just call those guys up and be like, Hey, remember I launched your gym and ripped a hundred grand out. I was like, I can show you how to do it and you can do it every month. Not just one month when I'm there and fun side note on this. So I did call those guys up. I think I did, I did like 240 grand in sales from the, the back category, back catalog. Wow. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it was, it was insane. I mean, for everyone who's listening, like I was broke up to this point. <laughs> like, We've been I get listening, it. Like, yes. It, it was insane, <laughs> right? And and uh, but here's the crazy part. And so I call up 32 gyms, right? And there were still a few gyms that didn't want to buy it. 
And the main reason was, how do I know it's going to work? Think about how ridiculous this was for a second. I had been to their oh, gym. You've already done and it, yeah. Sat at the front desk and fucking sold 200 people using the exact same thing I'm telling them. And they're like, I don't know if it's going to work in my market. And I was like, some people will never succeed. Like there is, this is like the Lazarus, like he, you know, you know, in the, in the Bible rise from the dead. He's like, there is no proof that will, that will, that some, some people's levels of skepticism will, will overcome. And that's only something I thought about only like years later. I was like, the fact that there were some people who didn't buy is still wild to me. And there were. And so we made the 240. Um, and the next month I think we did like 380. And the next month after that we did 40. Then 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 just under 800. And then a million. Then one two. Then one five. Then one eight. Then two. Then two two. Then two four. And then we kept straight lining all the way to 4.4 million a month. And it was a fucking rocket ride. We did 17 million in profit our first 12 months. Holy shit! That's real yeah. money. Profit. Like that's what my distribution was as an owner. Not even EBITDA. Like adjusted EBITDA or paper money. Like that was my distribution as a 27 year old. Layla's 23. Well, hold on. It was insane. like it's not lost on me how insane that was. It was, yeah. it was unlike. I mean, it was uh, in, in an eighteen month period. I went from looking up bankruptcy lawyers to figuring out what to do with multiple eight figures. Like it was just, I, it was unlike anything. Uh, you know, it was it was insane. It was insane. I have no, I have no. Uh, it's the only word I have for it. It was nuts. Hold on one second. I got to grab an ice pack. But hold on. I will. Be right <laughs> All right. Hold on. Please hold. All right, hold on a sec. Look at my old ass and ice pack. You're good, man. Hold on. Live your truth. <laughs> this is my, unfortunately, this is my fucking truth right now. All right, you ready? Yeah, rock. All right, so first of all, there's a couple of things out of that story. One, let's talk about Layla, okay? Shout out to Layla. We just saw it was her birthday yesterday. You know, this, yeah. by the time it's there, her birthday was a week ago. Yeah. First of all, with her, how good did it feel to tell her about, forget all the 17 million and all that, because that's, it's almost like, we can't even relate to that. It's like made up money. Yeah. Yeah. But we can wrap our head around a $60,000 day, right? Okay. How good did that feel? Because we've been along your journey. We've heard your whole story, right? Yeah. Loser move, yeah. loser move, DUI, <laughs> no processor, right? You get her friends to quit their jobs and you don't even know how you're going to pay them. And she's a part of this whole fucking process. Yeah. She yeah. stuck with you. Even told her to leave. She sticks with you for what God knows yeah. what reason, right? Yeah, and now yeah, you right. can finally say, "Look, look at look at what I did. Like, yeah. maybe I am an entrepreneur. Like, how good did that feel to you?" <laughs> um, you know, interestingly, like I don't think we even had time to process it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, we were in real talk. Like, uh, like that moment, it was like she was more like, "Wait, we're changing again." You know what I mean? Um, like in that particular moment, the first real moment we had was actually a hundred grand, um, which was later that month. So like it was like the exact moment of 60 K we didn't know it was going to be a thing yet. It was just like, I don't know what you just promised these people over the phone. You know what I mean? It was one of those situations of like, what am I, what did you just promise people that I have to deliver on now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was uh, a month or so later or two months later when like I paid all the, the negatives and you know, I had, cause I still had to cut because here's the crazy part. So like when we did the 60 K, like that 60 K wasn't mine. I still owed one fifty. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. right. Yeah, I forgot so, about that. Okay. Yeah. Right. The little, so I made the 150 grand in profit, but then like I, that got eaten by all the, all the, the refunds that I, that were owed. And then the next month we still had some refunds that were that less than the 150, but still another like 50 or so. Um, and so it was like two months later that I remember pulling up our, our bank account and where there was a hundred grand in it. And, um, I remember being like, Hey babe, like, check this out. And, uh, she's like making dinner or whatever. And I just like showed it to her cause I was getting choked up and she just, you know, she threw arms around me and you know, it, I, I'll say this, it, the, the first hundred grand was the richest I have ever felt to this day. Yeah. Because like, I remember, and right after I said that, I was like, I was like, babe, I was like, we can fuck up for three years and be okay. Because I, cause like we lived on together, we lived on less than 30 grand a year. Right. 
And so I like, I'm sure every, like for anyone who's broke right now, um, you probably know what your burn rate is, right? Like I knew what my burn rate was. Yep. Yeah. And I was like 30 grand a year. I was like, we're like 30 a year. I'm good. Like both of us together, we're good. And so I was like, we just bought, I was like, we can't lose now. I was like, we got three years of runway. Top of the world. And, uh, and that was, that was, and I think, I think about that a lot. Cause I'm like, I wonder why, why did I feel so rich in that moment? And I think it's because the relative change in wealth was so extreme. Because like if you have a thousand dollars in your bank account and you go to a hundred thousand dollars, you're a hundred times richer. Like the only way I'm a hundred times richer now is like if I no, if I go from now to ten billion. Like it's just it, yeah. and the likelihood that it happens is basically zero, right? Yeah. Uh not not in one day, right? And so that was uh that was that was my experience. Yeah. She's a hard hard bitch. <laughs> Talk about what she did for you, right? Well, first of all, let's talk about her as an entrepreneur because, hey, it sounds like if I'm betting based on your story before you have that $60,000 day, I'm betting on her. She figured out a way to transform her, her in-person online business to like her in-person to online. She's making four grand a month. She could hire salespeople, wrap that up. She's good. Like, I'm not betting on Alex. I'm betting on Layla, right? So we talk about her as an entrepreneur. You know, she... Because you're you've got such a huge following and stuff, and I yeah. like how you, especially yesterday, took a whole day just posting about her and stuff. But give her her props as an entrepreneur. Like, what what are her strengths? What is she really good at? I mean, Layla's the the yin to my yang. But if anything, like the yin and yang is probably not equal in terms of contribution to outcome. Like, there's like a white dot. If the rest of it was all black, you know, what I mean, that would all be Layla. Um, like, she's she's the she's the lion's share of why we have what we have. Um, she just doesn't get the credit for it. I think part of that's just because she's a woman, just being real. Um, but she's an exceptional entrepreneur. And the thing is, is that she's an exceptional leader. And for that reason, we've been able to build big businesses with infrastructure and people because she's so good at leading. Um, I've always been decent at promoting, um, just in general. Um, and I've over time now become pretty good at product. Uh, but that took much longer. I was, I basically came from the marketing side, realized that marketing only gets you to get someone to buy once and then product gets people to buy over and over again. And so put all your time in the product and then all of a sudden you don't need to market it. <laughs> It'll market itself. Uh, but that took me a long time. It took me a decade to figure that out. Um, but Layla's always put Layla does, with the crazy thing is that Layla truly doesn't care about money. Like she likes spending money. Don't get me wrong. And she'll be the first to say it, but she doesn't like, and to be fair, like the amount that she spends relative to her income is irrelevant. Um, but like she likes nice stuff and, and, and we've talked about it. She's like, when I was a kid and I couldn't afford stuff, she's like, I want nice things. And in the earlier part of our career, she kind of adopted my like, don't spend money on anything perspective. And it was only like a little later that she was like, that's you. That's not me. And she's like, I'm going to dress nice because I like yeah. dressing nice. And I'm going to I'm going to have these things. So I want these things. And if you don't want those things, fine. She's like, but I'm going to have these things. And so um, that was also just kind of like a nice, like us kind of figuring out our own individual things. Like I haven't changed. Like I don't, I, I don't care. Um, I do care a ton about money in terms of making it. I don't care about using it. Um, Layla doesn't care much about making it. She cares about using it. Um, but I, I say that because she's always been people driven. Like she's people first above everything. And it's one of those things that like, if you're people first, then you, you get the money. If you're money first, you don't get anything. And so I have a tweet that's going out tomorrow. I'll give a surprise tweet. But I, I, I was thinking about this today. If, you, if you're an entrepreneur who wants to grow in business and you focus on solving problems, you'll make money. If you're an entrepreneur and you're in business and you're focused on making money, you're going to have problems. And so... The thing is, is like the longer you've sat with a problem, like uh, Y Combinator and uh, Andreessen Horowitz, like those guys, one of the things they look at in founders is how long have they been in the problem? So like if I started a no strip company, mm -hmm. I've had breathing problems since eighth grade. So like I am intimately acquainted with every solution that's out there, all the drawbacks with them. Like I know the problems. And so if I was like, I want to start something because I fucking hate this. And if anybody else has breathing problems too, they will like this thing. It's like, it wouldn't be for money. It would be because I want to solve the problem, right? And it, you come at it differently, right? Um, and Layla has always been mission driven. And her personal mission has always been to create a place that people love to work. Like she genuinely, like from the first day I met her, she's like, I just want to create a company where people love working. 
and she works her ass off and she wants to create a place where other people work their asses off but she she's it's funny because her social media doesn't represent her as well um as maybe mine does um it's 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 not it's not multi-dimensional right like she you kind of see 2d on her mm -hmm. but the part that makes her a good leader and why people follow her internally is that she has this really good like matriarchal feel like she's 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 soft, but fair. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that she's been, like, she very much puts the human first, not the business. And she believes that if you put the human first, the business will take care of itself. And mm -hmm. our track record has been a testament to that. Um, and for the most part, like my day and Layla's day are wildly different. Like she is the person who actually makes the majority of the decisions in the business. And she is the one who runs all of the teams. And she's the one who hires all of the executives. Like, Layla does everything. Um, I am decent at talking. And so that is a skill that I have, right? And my, my skill set has been, like, my days for the most part, like, this week, every day, like, this is the only thing I have today. Um, yesterday, I had one podcast. Um, the day before that I had nothing. Uh, and then I think Monday I had meetings, but like I have, I like at least three days a week, I have nothing on my calendar, not including weekends, which I also have nothing on my calendar. Wow. So three to five days a week, I have truly nothing on my calendar. And that's because Layla tries to pull as much off of me as she possibly can so that I can have a couple good ideas. And so it's like when this, for example, like when the book that comes out, uh, in, uh, whatever it is, I think it's five weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Leeds book, here, I'll show you. Show you. Uh, yeah, show me the copy, right? It comes out uh, on a virtual event August 19th. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, I spent 2,000 hours writing this book. And I spent a long time writing the first book. But the first book to this day is 20% of our deal flow. And so it's like, I take a few, like, I'm like a few big moves type person. And Layla does the rest. Um, and that's, <laughs> we had a really early on in gym launch writers. We were like about a million a month. Um, we had probably 30 ish employees. So just like context of scale. And we go to this like operations coach and he's, you know, we pay for a day or whatever. And so he's like, I want you both to write down everything you do on this whiteboard, just everything, everything you do in the business. And so we all, we both write down everything that we do every single day. And there's this column that says Alex and Layla. And so he takes the marker and he circles like, 90% of the things on the board. And he's like, Layla, this is all yours. And then he circled like 10%. And he's like, this is Alex's. And I was like, I love this guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was just like, he's basically like, cause he's very, that, um, basically came to the school of thought of like, there are visionaries, and there are integrators, right? And Layla is a pure operator, like a pure thoroughbred operator. Like she's, she's a, she's a visionary operator. She's unbelievable. Um, and I usually operate best when I just have space and time. And if I have space and time, I come up with a couple good ideas. And so like, uh, like three days ago, I had the whole day and did nothing. I, and I, and I, had, I had a couple phone calls just talking to people, being like, hey, I've got this idea. What do you think about it? And um, that idea will do and it'll save us about two and a half million bucks this year. And so that's like common. It's just like, Hey, what if we did this? And then it's like, we should do that. And then, and then Layla's like, I got it. And then that's it. <laughs> and then I guess they can go. Uh, and so, yeah, I get, I get a disproportionate amount of the credit. Um, Layla protects me, uh, which is an interesting dynamic. Um, but basically just protects my time ruthlessly. Um, and is, and she has a team of two EAs. So it's her and two EAs that just fucking run train. You know what I mean? She, just plays absolute defense and she can just redirect everything to where it needs to go. Um, and so that I just have time. And because it's one of those, like if Alex gets locked in a room for a year, he'll come out with something that'll make us many millions of dollars. And so that's kind of been the way we do it. Now, one more thing on uh, Layla too, before we move on, uh, cause we have other things to talk about, but one other thing about her too, it sounds like kind of looking at your story and hearing what you've yeah. said so far, it's an, it sounds like, there was some anger and fear kind of fueling that fire that got you to this point, right? The, yeah. the point in the story where we're at now. 
did Layla help soften that? And because for me, like personally, fear and anger can get, get me voted. It can get me to take action a hundred percent and get me fired up. It can make me work longer. It can make me, you know, work that extra set or whatever that is. My mind builds up, but it also requires of a hell of a lot of fuel and it's fucking exhausting. Right. Mm-hmm. Did Layla soften that? And was that a good thing for you? I think we softened each other. Uh, I mean, when, when we met, she was also a steel wall. Um, and so the only thing that we had in common is that we just loved business. And so we were very much like almost business partners before we were romantic partners. And I, I've talked about this before, but like yeah. the, on our first date, I just pitched her on working for me. Um, and I was like, I don't know if this is going to work out. It's like, but you should totally work with me. We can make a lot of money together. And because um, I recognize talent. <laughs> you know? Game recognizes um, game. Right. No. And, and, uh, and she, she thought that I, you know, had some game. Um, I mean, I had five gyms at the time. I wasn't a complete nun dunce. Um, and the thing is, is like, I had 30 or so employees, like I could operate at a decent level, but nothing like how she can operate now. Um, but, uh, it was kind of, it was a, it was a cyclical removing of barriers. So like I would remove a, a layer of shell. She would remove a layer. I would remove a layer. She would remove a layer. And so I think we've just both made each other a lot better. Like we are both significantly kinder in general than we were. Like Layla and I were very cutthroat um, in the beginning, like very much like kill or be killed. Like Layla's first, she, uh, after her first date with me, she went to uh, her therapist and was like, I think this guy's a sociopath. Um, <laughs> and the therapist was like, well, it's actually a spectrum and he might have degrees of that. <laughs> and I mean, when she met me, my, my whole apartment had nothing in it except for uh, full-scale images of animals in attack position or mid-pounce or roar. What the fuck? That was all it was. I know. And it was because, obviously, I was a psychopath, but I was, like, in that mode. You know what I mean? And, and she asked me, she's like, why do you have this? And I was like, it's just a constant reminder to be killed or, kill or be killed. You know what I mean? It's like, you're either the hunter or the prey. And, uh, and she was like, you are going to kill me and chop me into little pieces. And, like, I didn't do dishes because I would eat over the sink. And I had a line of Coke Zeros, Red Bulls, Faye, and Egg Whites. And that was it. And then two bottles of Johnny Walker Black. That's what I lived on. And uh, and that was like, she was like, this guy is not normal. And that was that was me. You know what I mean? And she was also tough. Like, Layla was tough in the beginning. Um, but we just, we've we've gotten, we've been good for each other. So for sure, hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> <laughs> so with kind of glossing over, you know, yeah. you've got that business, you got supplement companies, yeah. right? You got, you, you kind of grow just speeding up. Right. So you, you take them all and you go tired of doing the gym thing, right? Yeah. Been the gym guy for 10 years. Let's just sell it and do something else. My first yeah. question, why most people in that position will go, I'm a big Howard Stern guy. I'm from the East Coast. I grew up listening to him, right? Yeah. And he it drives him crazy when somebody gets a role on a hit TV show and then jumps early to go pursue movies or something. He goes, you fucking yeah. idiot. This is a million to one shot. Every yeah. actor, I mean, they would kill to get on a hit TV show, right? And you just go, ah, eh, movies is probably where it's at, right? He goes, yeah. you know, you ride that show until, you know, yeah. they've made the movie. They've got the theme yeah. park ride. Everything stay. And yeah. they, people could say that about you too. It's like, dude, you're an entrepreneur, million to one thing. You've got multiple successful companies. You've got millions in the bank. You're, you're doing it. Yeah. Why stop? It's a really good question. Um, I mean, I was torn about doing it for a long time as well. Um, but Layla and I said when we started Gym Launch that we would keep doing it as long as it was the thing that we wanted to do. Um, and when we felt like we wanted to do other stuff, uh, we looked at selling it and the whole sales process for us was almost three years. Um, because we took a year to get ready. Um, and then we launched, uh, a month before COVID, um, and we were a gym company. And so obviously that wasn't the best timing. Um, and it's interesting cause I get a lot of, I get a lot of kudos for the sale, but like we were valid at 150 before COVID. And so, yeah. So like they were like, Oh, you sold for 40. I was like, I had a, a bad deal. Um, I now mind you, the terms of the deal were excellent. It was all cash. I walked away. There was no earn back. There was no consulting period. Like 
because I said, I was like, if I have to stay in this business, I was like, I'll just own it and I'm not going to sell. Yeah. Right. And so that was the, that was the, like, and it was funny because after the deal was done, I was talking to the managing partner of APG and I was like, dude, I, he's like, so why did you do it? You know, like now that it's over, I was like, I did it for the story, man. What do you mean? And he was like, if you wanted a bigger number, he's like, I could have papered that to like as big as you wanted. And I was like, but I would have known. You know what I mean? Like, cause the thing is, is like with these exits, just so anybody knows, like when I say, I, I add those extra caveats in there, when it's like, it was all cash. There was no earn out. There was no seller finance. There was no consult back period, which are all ways that you can soften a bigger valuation if you're buying. So like my number was hard. It was cash. Yep. And, and I, I said, cause like if I, he could have given me a hundred million dollar earn out and I could have said I sold for 150. Right. And then everybody like, Oh my God. You know what I mean? But, um, I did it because I wanted to do acquisition.com. Like I, I had made a couple deals and I knew that to legitimize the fact that we could help companies exit, having exited companies would help that. You know what I mean? Um, so there, I mean, like any big decision, there were multiple variables. So one variable is that I was tired of doing it and I'd made the decision emotionally a few years earlier. Um, there's an element of legitimacy that I knew it would lend me for what we wanted to do next. Um, the, uh, and I had already started doing deals and the first two deals I did have done amazingly well. Um, and on, it, what's interesting is that if those two deals, the first two deals I did had not gone as well as they did, I don't know if I would have sold the company. You'd be still in the gym business probably. I would have, I would have definitely, I mean, because so, uh, I don't know how much I, I've shared publicly. So, um, I will say that I had very strong reservations at multiple times in the process. Uh, meaning like I was considering not doing it, um, multiple times throughout the process, especially near the end when you actually like when, when the rubber hits the road and you really have to get it done. Um, and so this was by no means an easy decision. It was probably, it was the hardest decision I made in my life in terms of the amount of time I spent thinking about it. Um, but the thing is, is like, I can't live out that life. Like I could, like if I still own gym launch today, people would not see me the same way. Even if I still do the same thing that I'm doing now, people would not see me the same way. And so, um, all those reasons are, are ultimately why. And obviously, we got a check, and that that helped spur out the the things that we're doing in acquisition. But we'd already taken about forty out of the businesses before then. So, like, we were we were fine. Um, yeah. But the the two companies that we did worked so well. Um, they're still the two biggest companies in the portfolio, um, but they're also the oldest co- the companies we've been you know that we've yeah. grown the longest. So it's kind of the, the the chicken or the egg or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, anyways, so that's, so, that's why. <laughs> okay. So acquisition.com, you're making yeah. moves and stuff. Why bother with content creation? I do this. It's Ooh. a lot of fucking work, right? So like <laughs> lots of ups and downs. It's a, yeah. it's a time drain, right? Yeah. There's a cost associated with it, right? Especially at your level, you're cut, you get into editors and you need, you know, social media people and all this, right? You're a business yeah. guy. Why? In, okay, <laughs> you're you're an entrepreneur, right? If I'm going to invest time and money in something, what's yeah. what do I get out of this? And that's why. Before you answer that, that's why I like your content because without naming names, I saw this guy today. It shows up on Threads, and it just sometimes like the, the algorithm is weird. It's just people show up that I don't follow, and there's one fucking entrepreneur thought leader who's like the biggest scammy guy ever, right? Shows up and. You know, he's not the only one. They're selling courses and they're selling yeah. fucking conferences and all this bullshit. Yeah. And you know it's a scam. Where with you, I don't see there's yeah. it doesn't seem like you you want anything out of me or us, you know, us watching and, you know, consuming yeah. your content. I think that's why we like it. But there's gotta be something. Like what's in it for yeah. you? For sure. I'm super selfish, uh, and self interested. I just think um We all it's, are. it's yeah, right. So I, 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 I try to be as really upfront about that as possible because I don't want people to be like, this guy's a saint. Like, not at all. Like, no, I'm absolutely course. here to make money. Um, but so I'll say, I'll say the two, two sides. There's like the hard side and the head side. So the hard side is like, I do really recommend going, like making really big life decisions on a full stomach with a good night's sleep, uh, like looking at a beach or something like that, just in a different environment. Because... You, in my opinion, I think I, th- I make the best types of decisions when I'm in that state. Um, I have, th- I have the least scarcity motivation and the most like kind of abundance in my, like my thought process. And 
I think about death all the time and I think about time a lot. And I was like, okay, well, let's say if I fast forward to the end of my life, I was like, okay, well, with the amount of money that I have now, if I just put in the S&P 500 and did absolutely nothing, I'll be a billionaire no matter what. Yeah. So, okay, who cares? Because 500 years after that, no one's going to give a shit anyways, right? And so it's like, well, what do I want my life to be like? And so a lot of entrepreneurs are like, I want to make an impact. And the thing is, is like, I don't think I'm the guy who's going to like cure cancer or like figure out how to get to Mars. Like, that's just not my, not my hat. But like, I think that I can equip some of the entrepreneurs who will. And that's where I feel more called. Um, and I, I enjoy, like, no one writes a book for 2,000 hours unless they like it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I like it. It's hard, uh, but it's good hard. And I, I know the amount of lives it will change. And that feels good. Because, like, if I die tomorrow, I'll be like, I'm, I'm glad that I wrote. Because the thing that I will, re- like, I think the thing that we will be remembered for is not, is not the, the money that we make, right? Mm-hmm. It will be the, the books and the education that we put out that helps a lot other people. And I think, like, using that razor of being on the deathbed, I feel good about what we do. Now, for the head side, right, so that's the heart side, right? Um, the head side is... You can usually be the greediest if you extend the time horizon, right? And so long, long for me, I do like, you're like, you don't want anything out of us. What I want for people to do is genuinely win. And I actually want them to do that because I want them to win. and I want them to credit me for winning <laughs> and then say, <laughs> like, you want to be, you want us thanking you on the Oscar speech when we win our award? Or not even that. Business? Oh what no, I'm giving you the. I'm giving the head side okay. is so you're, you're 20, right? And you've gone through my stuff and you've, you've listened to all the content and you've, and you've read the book and you've read the next book that's coming out and books after that. And you use those books and you, and you create a business that's doing 10 million bucks a year when you're 25 or 28. And you're like, Alex working as at acquisition.com has been on my vision board for eight years. And like, I want to do a deal. That is what I want, but it's a long game. I have to sure. wait for people who don't have a business to create big businesses to come towards me because I'm a big believer that there's a lot of magic between the old and the new. And so the old is private equity investing, et cetera. And the new is social media. And I have yet to see someone combine the two, right? You've got the grants of the world doing the, doing the real estate, uh, raising money and all that stuff, which is a play, right? It's a play. Now he, he combined fundraising with social media, old and new, and he's doing really well with it, right? Just from that perspective. And, um, but I haven't seen anyone combine social media to get the one thing that every investor wants, which is proprietary deal flow. And so if investors saw the deal flow that I have, like whenever I sh- like share my screen and I show someone the deal flow, they're like, holy shit. And I'm like, yeah, I know. So I absolutely do get something out of the content that we make. It's just that 99.999% of people I don't get anything from. And that's okay. Because like, at the same time, it's like, we say we want, we're entrepreneurs, we'll make an impact. It's like, well, that's what that is. Making an impact. Great. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the, ideally, because I read um, during my like season of in-between uh, like companies. Now, it was before I had sold, but I was in like the sales mindset. Um, I read John Mackey's book, um, who's Whole the Whole Foods. Capitalism. Yeah, yeah, Conscious Capitalism. Yep. And I really, really liked how he thought about having like a win, 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 which is like, how can we, how can we create a business that everyone is better off from? And that was, and, and so, we, I mean, I spent 18 months thinking about what, because like, I didn't, I wouldn't have stopped gym lunch if I knew, if I didn't know what I was going to do next. Like some people sell their business, they don't know what they're doing. Like, that is not me. Like I had to know exactly what I was going to do. Acquisition.com was officially public the day after we sold. Like I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, and so, that, that 18 months, like I thought through a zillion different business models of like how, you know, like should we just build a big, big outbound team and just, you know, scale, like go after HVAC and do a roll up or, you know what I mean? Like there's a million things that I could have done, right? But I was like, you know, what's the one, like what stuff that I like doing, what stuff that Layla likes? Because there was a couple ideas that I really liked a lot, but Layla was like, I don't want to do that. And, there was, and I was like, okay, I die tomorrow. What business do you start? And she gave me a couple of ideas like, I don't want to do that business, right? But the one business that we both kept coming back to was this, was acquisition.com. And so... You create the content and that either attracts current level business owners that have solved the problem or somebody who goes from, let's say they, they, they get into my world at 5 million a year and then they grow to 15 million a year. Perfect. I mean, it's same, same for me. Right. And then they come towards us and we're like, cool, let's go from 50, you know, 15 to hundred or 15 to 50 or whatever it is. Right. And so, um, 
we have the one thing, or we have tried to do, or get the one thing from as many people as you can, which is trust. And so that is what I have spent all of my effort trying to do. And it was because my biggest deficit as an entrepreneur in the last season of my entrepreneur, because I, I kind of think of entrepreneurship in seasons. And so I, I think of them in five year seasons. And sometimes it could be seven. I mean, it's not exact, but like I had my me being a gym owner season, right? I had the me doing gym launch and figuring that out, Allen, Prestige Labs, that season. And I would say now I'm in the acquisition.com season. And maybe this is a much longer season. Who knows? But like for right now, I'm in the season. And the thing that I did not understand and I wildly missed, I think it's episode seven or episode eight of my podcast is Stop Branding is the title of the podcast. And I basically go on a rant about how branding stupid. And... <laughs> And it was because I didn't get it. I was like, you just need to, I was like, you need to run paid ads and you need to do outreach. That's it. Like, go away. You know what I mean? But it was because if you want to make sales tomorrow, that's the only thing you can do. For sure. But if you want to make mountains of sales, then you, you build a brand, right? It just takes time. And so I decided I wanted to build a brand based on goodwill. And I was like, well, what, what would someone who did that do? I was like, well, I would do what everyone else charges for and make it better and make it free. And so the fact that you have 100% gross margins also means that I can give it away for free and make it better. That's your problem, not mine. Yep. And so that was the idea. And I mean, I've, I've talked about it, like give away the secret, sell the implementation. Like, I think that's a much better business model. Um, and you attract way, you know, attract way better customers. Uh, and we don't have customers. I mean, we do, you know, we co-own the companies that, that we invest in. Um, and the people who come towards me, we don't have this map. Like when we did the deal with APG, like there was, there was zero trust, no trust. And it was, it was a, it was an aggressive negotiation. You know what I mean? Like not a fun negotiation and that's okay. And they're used to that. And that's just, that's the game they're in. Right. But I was like, I don't want this. Like I want to be founder friendly. Uh, I want to have plain English, plain English documents. I want to do, you know, transactions in 30 days. Uh, and I don't want to kick the founders out. I want to grow with, with them and figure out a way that we can both win. Right. And then also make a, a play where their employees win. Cause that's one of Layla's big passions. Right. And I want to uh, make it so that the marketplace wins overall. Right. So, so if I'm right hooking the marketplace all the time, like they're like, fuck this guy. Right. And so it's like, how can I just keep giving, keep giving, and then attract the, the people that resonate with that the most. They come in with trust already. If they've already used some of the stuff and doubled or tripled or 10x their business, then they already know that what I'm going to say works. I already know that they work because they already did it. Right? So there's a lot of shared trust that works there. So we actually, like trust is the ultimate lubricant in business. If you think from like an efficiency perspective, like you can do better deals faster and do repeat business with somebody. If you have trust, it's a huge competitive advantage. I and mean, so, in sales, like, what's the best customer to have a referral? Right, Cause there's repeat. trust totally. right off the bat. So it's not right. Adversary. Exactly. Or, yeah. And I was like, so how do I do that at scale? And so that was kind of the, the problem to solve was like, how do I create the most value at scale uh, for the most people? And so that was, you know, I started making content and, as much as people think that I'm pumping out a lot now, like I'm still in the early days of my GMAT for this game. Uh, so like I saw the input output equation for volume of content. And I was like, oh, done. You know what I mean? Like right now, I think we put out 250 or 300 pieces of content a week. I saw that. And, and we'll, we'll be at 1,000 within 12 months for sure. And we're going to be doing more. Like you, like, everyone's listening. Like, you will see what's going to happen in the next 12 to 24 months. But um, it will be... Uh, Interesting, uh, but I have. We're going to be. We're launching. Uh, well, I, I might as well say it here. So we're we're launching Mosey Talent, or we have launched Mosey Talent, uh, which is our talent community. Um, and so it's like while everyone else is uh, trying to sell you uh, a, a way to get the skill, I want to give you the skill, and then I want to pay you to do the skill that we just taught you in one of our companies. Um, because like, I will make more money if you are good at what you do inside of a business. Sure. It's just, a, it's just flipping the game. You know what I mean? So it's, what are you it's teaching really, them? So who, like, are you Oh, you will courses? see. You will see. That's coming okay. out. That's coming that's out. That's the teaser? Out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's my teaser. But if you are a badass at anything, you already have a skill, just mosey talent. You go to acquisition.com and uh, apply for careers where we love to interview you. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. One more thing because we're almost out of time. I like there how you. we started the interview with the GMAT example, inputs, outputs. 
And we kind of end with it's the same thing, right? You took the same attitude. I'm going to ace the GMAT. I'm going to sit down. And you have a long view of things. You don't need to go, shit, my fourth tweet, you know, got two legs. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. I'm in this for like five years. I don't give a fuck what engagement yeah. I have today. Like, I want to get better every day. But okay, you know, this isn't. Yeah, also the, the idea of like being on new platforms and stuff, like, People get weird about it, but like, it's just, it's just eyeballs. You know I mean, it's just attention. It's people who don't know who you are. So it doesn't really ma- Like I'm so platform agnostic, like don't care at all. It's just, it's just, you learn, you know, you learn whatever the context of the platform is. Um, and I'll say this, I think the big, a big mess up that people have who are making content. And again, I'm still new to this game. Like it's not a funny cause I, I like people get ask me here, about bro, stop. No, I am. Well, you're like at the top of the food chain, but it's I'm not like, you're I'm, just some, oh, I'm just figuring this out. But I am still figuring it out. Okay, I'm only two right. years in. This is nothing. At a high level, you know, I'm, I'm being dead serious. I'm okay. just figuring it out. And so some of the some of the things that I feel like why it doesn't work for a lot of people, one is that they don't change. They don't get feedback. So they do the volume. Well, first they don't do the volume. So that's number one. But assuming you do the volume, right? Is that they don't they don't adapt. They don't they don't get feedback. They start doing some type of content, starts working, and then they keep doing it, and then it stops working, and you know, and then they don't change, and then they they keep making. I'm sure you've seen some older guys who like figured out Facebook Live, and they're like still going live today, and it's been like six years, and you're like, bro, like maybe not a good time, right? But the piece that I think is missing is the evidence, and what I mean by that is that. Part of the reason that I think that our content gets more lift is because we've actually done stuff. And so it's like, I didn't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I had, like, I only got, so uh, uh, I'm going to give you my, my secret cheat code for everybody who's listening is that I got in good shape and I was in good shape for a while. I competed at a high level. I had a state record or two, I think. Um, like I was pretty, pretty good at fitness. I looked fit and I was also pretty strong. And then people were like, how do I get in shape? So they started asking me because I had done stuff. Yeah. And so then I was like, oh, you do this. And then that business started doing well. And then people who taught other people how to get in shape were like, dude, how do you teach other people to get in shape? And I was like, well, this is what I did. Cause I had six gyms. So I had some credibility. Right. And like, and then and I felt weird because I remember when I got in the, into that, that space, I told Layla, I was like, I don't want to be another one of these fucking guys. You know what I mean? And the thing is, is that everybody that I was competing against in that space and that Jim Wong still competes with today is like ha- probably three quarters of the marketplace is in their mom's basement telling gym owners what, the, what to do with their gyms. Never even run a gym. Yep. Right? Or the 25% of the market that, uh, that has run a gym has only run one. And so when I came to the marketplace as some young gun – Right. Because there were some established guys who were in that place and we dethroned them. Right. Pretty quickly. And it was because one, they hadn't updated their stuff. And two, I was like, I just did 32 launches in the last two years. Like, I know what it's like to be in an Asian market, a black market, a white market, a Canadian market, a U.S. market, Mexican market. Like, I've been in all of them. And I know what to do when you sell to poor people. I know what you do when you're in a richer market. I know what you do when you've got shitty parking. Like, I know because I did it. Right. And so I had that proof. And so people were like, how are you confident? I was like, cause I did it already. Like it wasn't, I didn't need to make it up and like beat my chest. It was like, this is how you do it. Cause I did it that way. Right. And then same thing with, uh, like, you know, when we scaled gym launch, people who had B2B services business were like, how do you scale this thing? Just, you know, so profitably. I'm like, well, this is what I did. And so the thing is, is like, I, I am so, I always want to have hard proof so that I can't be questioned. Right. And I think that that's the piece that a lot of people miss. Like you've got the, the, the dent, like how many marketing books, this one fucking drives me. That's why I'm excited about the leads book. But, um, how many marketing books do you see that have like 18 reviews on Amazon? A million. I'm like, why bother? Yeah. Like why? Like if you were a marketer and you claim to know how to market, go market and your book, yeah. And your book has no, has no proof at all. Yeah. Why even read it? Why read it? I have proof right now that you suck, right? Like I get DMs every day from, from teeny boppers being like, Hey, I can help you with your content and grow your following every day. I'm sure you do too, right? I'm every sure single day. Yeah, I get I five, 10 a day. And I, and I, because I just like being sadistic. I like go over, I look at their profile and it has like 18 followers. Yep. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're like, yeah. what, like, who are you fooling? Yep. You know what I mean? And the thing is, is they might fool some people, but they fool poor people. They fool people who are inexperienced, who are ignorant, who didn't even think the first level of logic, right? And like, in my opinion, every single person who consumes content 
the first unspoken question is why should I listen to you? Yep. And I think that is the number one question that has to get solved before anything else comes out of your mouth. And the that's the hard one. That's the that's the that sixteen takes time. GMAT. Yeah. Right. That's the GMAT book. Right. Yeah. Like if I talked about GMATs, I would say, here is my seven forty. That's what I got on the GMAT. It's above Harvard's mid score. Good enough for them. Maybe it could help you. If you're above that, then don't fucking listen to my content. You don't need me. Like, if you're a billionaire, don't listen to my content. <laughs> you know, like, you know what I mean? I can tell you I've gotten to hear. And I actually had a guy reach out to me. I know I'm ranting on this, but no, guy reached out to me. And, uh, and he, says, he says, hey, in your, in your video, you said you don't know how to get to a billion. I want to give you some advice. Because I talked about how I've gotten to 10 million a month, right? Like between the portfolio and up. I talk about levels, right? So, you know, 100K, million a month. Was, unless this was Tim Cook, I ain't listening. Like, who is this guy, <laughs> right? right? Like, Tim Cook reached out to me. I would be like, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay, I got you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have whatever you want. Um, and so he's like, you know, have you considered? And I'm like, dude, first off, <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> like, point one, right? Like, you know, he says with no businesses, right? But the second point is, I was like, I said, not that I don't know how to, but I was like, but I would never say I know how to until I'm there. And then I'll say, this is how I did it. And, the, and the, here's the nuance is that it's not like, here's how you do it or here's how to do it. Here's how I did it. And no one can fight you on that. It's like saying you should have oatmeal for breakfast versus I had oatmeal for breakfast. No one can fight me on I had oatmeal for breakfast. I had oatmeal for breakfast. Here's how I built my whatever. What are you going to do? That's what I did. Right? No one can fight you there. But it's, as soon as you start projecting and preaching and doing the shoulds and finger waving, that's when everyone hates you. And the thing is, is the dual combo of suckage is finger waving with no proof. Which and they almost people, always go hand in hand. Almost. Right. And most people do both. Yep. And so it's like if you do one of two, you're way ahead. But if you can do zero of two, if you just say, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. This is what I did. Hope it helps you. If you do that over and over again, then like no one wants to attack you. Yep. And I get a compare like, hey, I'm a plumber. Like, what content should I make? I'm like, make shit about plumbing. Because you could say, this. here's Sally. I just fixed her sink. This was the issue she had. Maybe it helps you. And you just do that. Yep. And I was like, and that's where you can be king. I was like, you can't make general business content because you're, you're a single location local plumber. I'm not saying that what you're saying might not be true. It absolutely might be true. But it doesn't pass the first question, which is, why should I listen to you? You have yep. no proof. Yep. Right. And that's not All the right. sexy answer because when I look at you, especially last year when I can't every fucking oh I want TikTok fucking Alex Ramosi again this motherfucker get off I try to swipe you off he's like he's everywhere right so what's everybody yeah. do everyone copies your exact same style and the format and even the content and even it has got to drive before I get to the, the drive you crazy so everybody's doing that right but you kind of went away from that you went to a simpler kind of you know. Yeah. image and branding and stuff yeah. it may have got them views initially because it was the same style and it was hot at the moment but where are they now and they may have been selling, saying the same exact thing and i'm sure they were as you but they didn't have evidence wait who is this guy where's he from what has he done you what's know, the first he's screaming the loudest he's the one yeah. screaming the loudest like listen to me where alex ramosi's like hey this is me. Like I, I did this. I built I, a couple businesses. I was a gym guy and I did that. And like, here's what I learned. Like, if you want it, yeah. great. Like I'm rich anyway. Like I don't need you to love me. Like, and I think that's, what's most attractive about your content is you're not finger waving and you're not screaming at us. It's like, Hey, it's, it's kind of altruistic. Like, Hey, this is what I learned. I'm just trying to share it with you. If it helps you, if I was one person, cool, you know, that's it. I've always thought of education as the ultimate legacy. So like if you die and you leave no education to anyone else, what a waste of a life. It's like all of us are here and we're all here. It's like, I don't know who made the light. I mean, <laughs> okay. I do you know who made the light bulb, right? Uh, but, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> for everyone at home. Uh, but like, I don't know the guy who invented wallpaper. I don't know the guy who, you know, like who, who came up with this table setup, like windows, glass. Like, I don't know any of that stuff, yeah. but the guy who started, the, you know, Edison made the light bulb. And then we were like, hey, if we put 100 little ones in a row, we have a screen. You know what I mean? And so, like, everything we have is always piggybacking on past humans who we don't know the names of. And, like, I full-heartedly expect to be another human that other people catapult off of that they all forget me. And so it's like I'm just trying to document as much as I can to try and pass on as much as is useful to other people. And I think that when I, when I die, that will be what I am proud of. You know, and I think – 
you know, that's a great note to end on. I think that was a great note for content creators out there too, is I'm sure you get up every day asking for advice because everyone wants to be a creator, but your answer was the best answer. And it was also the most unsexy, unfun answer, right? Is basically, you're, I'm paraphrasing, is this correct? Go do something, become successful yeah. at something first before you tell other people how to become successful, right? You can't do that without the evidence. Is that basically your message? Yes, Don't do, do shit and talk about what you did. Yeah. Right? Do shit and talk about what you did, repeat. And the, here's, and I'll, I'm gonna piggyback on myself, self piggyback. <laughs> um, not, not only that, but like most content creators look at the top content creators and then say, I'll do that. But they lack the story, right? And so it's like, you're not like, it's so funny because I hear these little, little teeny boppers, right? And uh, they're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're like, I want to be a motivational speaker. Right, you're like, that's like the end thing. You know, but they want to they want to start being motivational speaker today, right? Yep. And it just doesn't it doesn't make, the sequence is off, and so it's like everyone forgets order, right? What's the order we do this in? And so, and that's where that's where actually modeling success can actually get into your can. You want to model the rise, not where someone's at now. It's like, oh, in order to be rich, I should fly private. Like, doesn't work that way. It's like if I want to get tall, I should play basketball. It doesn't work that way, right? It's like. What's, what's the thing they did to get there? Not what they're doing now. Like, oh, I should, uh, if I want to be rich, I should make two investment decisions a year, like Warren Buffett. It's like, I don't, I mean, maybe it'll take you a long time. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you, you, you get where I'm going with this. For sure. And it was the same thing with me too. Like when I started to create content and I still have a long, long way to go, but I finally I'm interviewing the same people as other people are doing. And I'm kind of like, almost trying to be like them but then i realized like wait a minute i'm way more relatable than that fucking guy i am not wildly successful i'm not a millionaire if you're watching right i sold kitchen equipment for the fucking last 10 years and finally quit last year like i've got a way more relatable story the guy who's talking to alex hermosi tomorrow that went to harvard i can't fucking relate to that guy like oh i went to harvard and then i fucking worked worked at this consulting firm and then i was a successful founder harvard wouldn't yeah. accept me Fucking, I couldn't get yeah. a job at the consulting company. Like, yeah. so I think there's value in your own story. Everybody has something unique about them. And instead of trying to be Alex Hermosi and copying his style and copying what he is yeah. posting about, like you got a unique flavor. That's all your own. Like I lean into that. I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback on that. So uh, my, my director of brand, like he, he likes sending me the videos that are like the breakdowns of Alex Hermosi strategy. Um, and uh, they're great. Um, and, I, and I say this out of absolute love for everyone who does it, so I can appreciate it. But this, I'm, someone's like, I read a tweet thread that was like, Alex Ramos, these four pillars of content. And I was like, oh, what are they? <laughs> I was like, I was scrolling myself, right? I'm like, oh, interesting. I was like, don't do that at all. But like, cool. You know what I mean? Uh, and so a lot, what I think what all, people are like, oh, he's, so he, notice he has these personal totems. Like he's got like never skip dessert and he's got the calves and he has the, the nose thing and he wears beaters, right? And he's, he's like weird with his shoes and like all this stuff. It's like, those were not, I wasn't like sitting in a room one day being like, how am I going to create this brand that is Alex Ramosi? This is how I dress. And I dress this way because I get hot a lot. That's why I wear beaters <laughs> and they're better than, than any other tank top I've tried that money can buy. A thin cotton tank always wins, right? And I wear nose strips because since eighth grade, I haven't, I haven't been able to breathe. I've had two nose surgeries. That's why. And I get all the people are like, I don't know what you think it does for attention. It's like, I can't breathe. That's why. <laughs> That's me breathing. That was, if you're curious, like, what the fuck was that sound? That's what the inside of a fucked up nose sounds like. All right? Like, that's legit, right? Like, the shoes, I bought a hundred pairs of shoes because I have, <laughs> I have arthritis in one of my feet. Right. And so I, I wear all these different shoes and I have like different levels of tests that I take them through so that I know that like I can wear this without pain. Right. Like I have. And part of the reason that I have foot pain is because I had small calves and a girl that I was dating was like, why don't you train your calves? And I've been training calves for 10 fucking years when she told me that. Right. And so then I switched and I started training them first every single day, every day, no matter what, when I went to the gym and I did so much calf volume that I put, I put arthritis in one of my feet because I've done so much. <laughs> and so I'm proud of my calves because it was the hardest part of my body to grow. Notice I don't talk about my chest or my traps because I've always had them. I've always had a six pack. I don't talk about those, right? And so like I eat dessert every night mostly because it was in spite of the fitness community because I was so tired of people like not living life, not eating anything that they were always like never skip Monday, never skip, never skip uh, leg day. So I was like, 
never skip dessert. And I did it as a joke. And then everyone just went nuts with it. And so like these things were not designed. They were just me. You know what I mean? And so like I, I heard a piece of, of content from Gary that I really liked. I'm pissed he said it because it's really good. Uh, I want to have said it first. No, but Gary, it was a great, it was a great, it was a great uh, thing. He said, he said, dude, the niche is you. Like you're the niche. You know what I mean? And so it's like, well, like look at Rogan. It's like, well, Rogan wasn't like, oh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna toss in some comedy because I like, co- you know, and I'm gonna toss in some fighting stuff and then like shrooms and then aliens, right? Like, and then like, and then AI and tech and then politics a little bit, right? Like he, he did. He's just fucks with that stuff. And so that's what he talks about. And so like, I fuck with the stuff that I like. I actually really like philosophy. I like comedy. I like marketing and sales. I like business stuff in general. And that's what my content's about. And I, and I look really fit because I've been in fitness for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's a part of my life now. And so I, I can talk to it. Right. And so like, how do you recreate that? Get interested in stuff, do things, and then talk about the stuff that you did. And you probably do have a few completely disjointed things that you're into. You might really like lava lamps, and you <laughs> right, <laughs> right, and and like really might like kitchenware, and you really also might like uh, biohacking stuff, whatever, right? Yeah. And so it's like it's the it's the combo of five things in different proportions that then creates the thumbprint that makes the creator unique. Yep, bro, that is a great thing to end on. Stay put because we're gonna we're gonna play a quick game too, and then you can enjoy your Friday night. But dude, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. I wish I could do this. I wish I could have done this in person, but this was I got a bad back, so he we had to do this via Zoom. So I appreciate your time, brother. I appreciate you talking with me too. I learned a lot. And guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like the interview, subscribe and turn on notifications. New interviews every Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And also, we printed up some hats. It's time to level up. We just did one round. Go to TomWord.com. Check them out. Once they saw it, they're gone. So thank you so much, guys.